Good evening, everyone. I'm Neil. Uh, my name is Bob Cassell. I'm the director of the Hafenreffer Museum. And uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker, uh, let me announce the next speaker in our speaker series. On Thursday, October 23rd at 5.30, Kevin McBride, the Director of Research at the National Tucket Pequot Museum and Research Center and Associate Professor of Anthropology at UConn, will give a presentation entitled Uncovering the 1676 Battle of Nipishaw. This talk is an introduction to the Battlefield Survey Project he's running, and is focused on identifying and documenting the locations and boundaries of the movements, sites, and actions associated with the Second Battle of Nipishaw during the King Philip's War. The Shep Kretsch Lecture was established in 2012 to honor Professor Shep Kretsch, the former director of the Half American Museum. It focuses on Native American peoples and cultures in the context of museums, environmental issues, and sustainability. The past speakers have included Kirk Dombrowski and Sergey Kahn. I'm very pleased to introduce now uh, Professor Clark Erickson. Professor of Anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania and curator in charge of the American section at the Penn Museum, who will be the third uh, recipient of this lectureship. Uh, Clark's body of work explores the intersection of indigenous knowledge, cultural landscape creation and management, biodiversity, and sustainable lifeways. His research has been and continues to have a demonstrable public impact. For example, his work has been featured on the BBC documentary The Secrets of El Dorado and it's been cited extensively in Charles C. Mann's national bestseller, 1491, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus. Clark is a leader in the application of historical ecology to archaeological questions. Historical archaeology, I'm sorry, historical ecology is a research program that explores the complex interactions of peoples and the environments in which they live. It emphasizes the long term in order to get a better understanding of how peoples have manipulated the environment and how these transformations have in turn affected them. Clark has collaborated with uh, William Bailey, an ethnographer and ethnobotanist, in a path-breaking book entitled Time and Complexity in Historical Archaeology, Studies from the Neotropical Lowlands, published by Columbia University Press in 2006. This important uh, volume offers a new landscape-focused perspective on the static and unproductive nature versus culture opposition. Clark's work has also helped deconstruct popular myths about Amazonia. For example, he notes that the romantic imagery of Amazonia as a natural wilderness belies a very different reality, namely that of a land domesticated by humans. In Amazonia, native peoples created a domestic landscape resulting from both intentional and unintentional actions. They have managed the environment through a variety of techniques that included transplanting, culling, and controlled burning. Instead of view viewing Amazonia as a pristine form of nature, it is therefore more accurate to conceive of it in the same way we would conceive of a garden. Clark is also one of the foremost scholars in applied archaeology, that is using archaeology as a tool to meet local community needs. He is internationally known for his important work on raised field agriculture in the Lake Titicaca Basin of the Andes and in the Llanos de Mojos region of the Bolivian Amazon. In 1986, Clark conducted a series of raised field experiments in the Andes. He found that the decomposing aquatic plants in the canals were an effective fertilizer in renewing the soils of the platforms. He also found that in the high Andes, where frost is a serious problem at night, the water of the canals uh, of the raised fields help store the sun's heat and blanket the fields in warm air at night, protecting the crops against the cold. Raised field agriculture is highly productive and if managed properly, fields can be planted and harvested for many years. Clark's team was among the first group of scientists to explore the technology of raised field agriculture and the first to apply it in a small-scale rural development project involving local Indian farming communities. But for some of you, Clark's most impressive credentials may be his work as a, a consultant for Sam Cagli Caglione, owner of Dogfish Head Brewery. <laughs> Clark is a brewer himself, and he encouraged Sam to make chicha. Sam wanted to do this in the traditional way, which involved uh, chewing the cornmeal to mix it with saliva and uh, fermenting it. This whole process is shown in one of the episodes of Bre Brewmasters. Clark's student, Alexei Branich, is featured as taking Sam around to see the various uh, chicha brewers. Clark's talk this evening is entitled Pre-Columbian Mon Monumental Landscapes in the Bolivian Amazon. 
There's a re reception following tonight's talk in Manny Hall Gallery across the green. There is beer, but alas, no chicha. Please join me in giving Clark a warm welcome. <laughs> speak in this Shep Crutch, the third lecture series. Uh, Shep was a major contributor to the scholarship on the relationship between humans and the environment, historical ecology, anthropogenic landscapes, and indigenous knowledge. As you'll see, these topics are dear to me. Um, I, instead of using historical anthropology and chronicles and history that Shep used, I approached this through the archaeological record, landscape features, patterns, and associations, some experimental archaeology, and visualizations to understand this long human history of landscapes. The concept of monumentality has been central to archaeology since its beginnings. Monuments are subject of thousands of coffee table books about archaeology and are central to our courses that we teach our students. Massive uh, monuments of stone, brick, or and or earth are considered physical manifestations of centralized governments, efficient political economies, and other things. B. Gordon Child um, said that monumental architecture was one of the key traits defining civilization, what we now call complex society. Um, in most archaeologists' minds, monumentality is a physical manifestation of a complex, hierarchical, and centralized society. Large-scale monumental construction found in prehistoric societies lacking written records generally assumed to be associated with state societies. Um, according to Bruce Trigger, the impracticality of monuments is their intended message. Um, in simple cost-benefit analysis, monuments are a colossal waste of time and energy. It could be dedicated to food production, um, shelter, and security. Monuments are highly visible, potent symbols of the elite's ability to mobilize or administer labor of the commoners that they control. Monuments um, are, are the scale and often complexity of design and engineering that goes far beyond what's necessary for serving the basic needs of the people that built them. Monuments are considered um, to be these um, signs of wealth and also power materialized. Monuments are um, generally associated um, at least in most archaeologists' minds, with hierarchical forms of political organization. Although some archaeologists now are willing to grant non state societies uh, the ability to build monumental works. Archaeologists um, know monumentality when we see it. Um, it's usually defined by an arbitrary definition, references to size, specific building materials, and or comparative aesthetics. In rare cases, monuments are evaluated using energetic studies and experimental archaeology to inform us about the labor invested in them. Um, archaeologists, historians, and art historians um, of the world culture area have, have their own vision of what is considered monumentality. In a recent edited volume by Richard Berger and Robert Rosenwig and many colleagues, uh, they surveyed diverse monumental constructions with a wide range of um, state societies and non-state societies. The editors point out that the low mound of one culture uh, might be considered monumental, could be questioned by scholars working in another region where they have, where they consider more labor-intensive constructions or more aesthetically pleasing in some cases. Um, in a seminal, somewhat cynical, tongue-in-cheek article from the from 1990, Bruce Trigger proposed that prehistoric monumentality is characterized by its impractical, non-productive use of energy of the subjects by the elite classes to create great works of engineering, art, and of large scale. As these highly visible constructions, monumental works uh, serve ideological functions to demonstrate the power of states to conspicuously consume energy. According to Traeger and Joyce Marcus, monuments tend to be most impressive um, at the dawn of state societies, in terms of scale and the available resident population workforces, rather than the societies with more resources they command in later, later time periods. Why is this? Probably because the leaders of these societies are more insecure in their powers over subjects, potential subjects, um, and try harder. In Indian archaeology, where I've done some of my work, my mentality is considered a physical correlate of the appearance of complex society. 
When the southern Andes, we're told that the lead in public architecture first occurs in the early horizon and early intermediate period with stone faced platforms and sunken courts. Through the lens of cultural evolution, the increasing scale and amount of labor invested in monumental buildings is often correlated with increasing social complexity. Uh, Amazonia and the human tropics are not often considered when one thinks first describing cases of monumentality. Of course, we are all familiar with the tropical forest monuments of the Mayan civilization in um, Mexico, Guatemala, and Angkor Wat in Cambodia. So, in the Amazon, um, many scholars up till fairly recently, some still think this, that um, tropical areas in the neotropics of the Americas, but also in areas of Africa and Southeast Asia, are not the kinds of environments um, where you can have development of civilizations and their trappings such as monumental constructions. And part of this um, is uh, from a very powerful theory invented by Betty Meggers, promoted in the 1950s, um, what she called uh, environmental determinism. And her idea was very simple, and her studies of Amazonian societies and compared to other parts of the world argued that um, peoples in tropical forest areas and human tropics, not always forested like this, an exaggerated image, but um, were, were uh, essentially pawns of their environment. And um, she looked primarily at soil and the limitations of soil. And so um, when you have poor soils, many tropic or tropical areas are defined by poor soils, um, they limit the potential for development of uh, large populations. And so she argued that what she and historians, a lot of ethnographers reported that the main form of agriculture in many tropical areas is slash and burn agriculture. And it's been damned by many of the um, development people and you know, the waste of land. It requires large areas of forest to be able to survive. And so um, um, usually you'll cut down the forest, you'll dry it to a certain extent, burn it several times. Plant immediately before weeds start appearing, use it two or three years, sometimes longer. Um, and then it's usually considered abandoned or in fallow, and people move on to a new plot, cut that down, and rotate around. We might come back to the same spot maybe in 15, 20, maybe longer periods of time, and the forest is kind of quote unquote recovered. And so this requires it was a group of people, a fairly large area to operate in to make the system work. And so that doesn't allow large populations to build up in these areas. Um, others have pointed to other kinds of limitations like protein. And so uh, many of the ethnographic studies and modern studies and conservation studies have argued that um, uh, native peoples, um, if their populations get too big, they wipe out their protein source, the game animals that they hunt, and there's a limited supply of those. And so, uh, um, by default, populations can't go beyond a certain limit of the compare carrying capacity um, of the protein resources. Um, what we do know from early archaeology done in the Amazon region, especially at the mouth of the Amazon, the central Amazon, by many museums have objects from these, um, these cultures. Uh, these are the top or burial urns from the central Amazon, and um, also some very fine art, very elaborate pottery, and also stone objects that indicate that something was going on down there. And the people that actually paid attention to the sites noted that they were very large and um, extended sometimes for hundreds of meters, sometimes for kilometers along some of the uh, main rivers of the central Amazon. We also have an incredibly rich historical record for some time periods, uh, most of it from more recent times, and um, much about the linguistics and different ethnic groups that make up the Amazon. So like many tropical areas, we have incredible cultural heterogeneity, and a lot of this is talked about in terms of the languages that people speak. And um, there, no one's really worked out the sort of the best explanation for this incredible mosaic of different languages, but um, tracing it through some of the pottery styles and also using historical linguistics, we can show that these peoples were very cosmopolitan. They were moving long distances, migrating, uh, maybe driving out previous occupants of the major river valleys, some moving along the coast, shows some of the, um, the major movements on, on the uh, right that have been documented. And then a number of recent discoveries, some of these you might have read about in the popular news, 
um, or what we call Amazonian Dark Earth, or known more popular as Terra Preta. And this is um, there's incredibly rich, black, greasy, organic soils that have been found associated with, in this case, looks like all these pebbles and stuff coming out of the excavation. Those are all potsherds. Um, and this is a particularly deep one, but um, some of these extend up to seven kilometers along some of, not the Amazon itself, but on some of the even smaller rivers that empty into the Amazon. Not all of them are that big, but some are, are quite extensive and very deep. And these are essentially huge garbage men, but all archaeological sites, if, you're, if you've ever done or participated on an archaeological site, you run into middens, that's where people dump their garbage and stuff, but they tend to be kind of small, you know, they're maybe, you know, a hole they filled up with the garbage, and when that was filled up, they filled up another hole, but they don't extend at, across miles of, of landscape. And you see some of the striking differences of the soil, the dark colored stuff, that, um, I call it, um, standing there with, and the typical uh, oxidized soils below. And these are resources that are recognized by local peoples that live in the Amazon. Many of these are truck farms today for the major cities of Manaus, Santaram, and Belém along the main Amazon. And um, so farmers realize these things, these are actually mined and dug up people's backyards um, and sold for very, very valuable potting soil for the urban populations. And you can see the parent material on the right and what Amazonian people are doing through some kind of incredible ingenuity of taking soils that are pretty much worthless and turning them into incredibly fertile soils. Um, other colleagues of mine are working in areas where nobody paid any attention, the upper rivers, uh, what we call, in the areas between rivers called um, sort of these, these higher plain, well-drained areas that uh, apparently um, most studies don't have many resources for human occupation, and we wouldn't expect to find much there. Michael Heckenberger, uh, working on the Jingru River, has found an incredibly large urban, what he's calling urban centers, um, not probably the same as sort of vision cities. Um, this is one of sort of an artist's conception, one of these. Um, he thinks they were palisaded, like some of the features we'll talk about in a minute, with grand avenues, huge plazas, um, and thousands and thousands of people. And over the years, he and the students have been able to document incredible webs of connections between these major centers to secondary centers and tertiary centers, connected on the long, large avenues that were created, um, connecting some of them straight, some of them not so straight, and all kinds of earthworks that ring them, defining them. And a recent study has actually found that they're laying these things out on probably some kind of a cosmic grid that the major sites line up, and not on a north-south axis, but a sort of an inner cardinal axis. And then many of the secondary sites, shown here as red dots, are actually on another axis. It's almost perfectly 90 degrees oriented off of that. And so this indicates that something big is going on. These aren't little independent villages practicing slash and burn agriculture. These are settled folk living in very large um, population concentrations. Also, um, another feature that's uh, got a lot of publicity, we'll talk more about this in a few minutes, are the so-called geoglyphs found in Acre and also now in Rondonia and Mato Grosso um, in the western Amazon region. And many of these are showing up simply because we have Google Earth now, we can find them easily, and a lot of um, nasty deforestation, um, removal of forest cover that ex for pasture that exposes these incredible earthworks. You can see some of them here. A uh, wide variety of geometric forms and shapes earthworks within earthworks, um, and some of these um, extending hundreds of uh, meters um, on each side. Um, but I, I've been interested for a number of years in what the landscape, so all this area between our traditional archaeological sites, what it can tell us about peoples of the past. And we have an incredible record from centuries of archaeological research um, on palaces, on royal tombs, on cities of the past. And um, in the 1960s and 70s, archaeologists said, well, you know, maybe we should focus on the rest of society. Um, you know, the 99.9% .9 of the people that lived in the past. And where would you find them? Well, maybe in the poor areas of urban centers, you might find them on the edges of cities, uh, workers' camps associated with these monumental works that we've been studying for, for centuries. But it's probably out in the landscape, like a lot of rural peoples today, they're, they're out 
living in small hamlets and villages across the landscape, and most of their lives are spent out in the open space, farming, going to the neighbors. And what can these places tell us about interaction and levels of society, complexity, and um, what do those people sort of do to transform the landscape? So I've been working with a number of scholars and colleagues on historical ecology, and we've been um, essentially arguing that all environments, there's no such thing as wilderness out there, it's a sort of cultural category that's been invented, all landscapes have human impact. Now, to what degree do they have an impact? And some people say, well, yeah, every landscape, <laughs> some humans have gone through it, done some sort of things at various times in the past. Um, some are, you know, certainly have a very heavy hand um, and sort of a very early register of archaeological transformation. But, um, you know, where, where's sort of the threshold? And um, a lot of this is because no one's really looked in the archaeological record, but it's so exciting as an archaeologist to be able to address and sort of address uh, long-term environmental change, long-term environmental history, look at issues of biodiversity through the archaeological record using the concept of, um, of landscape. And so what's wonderful about landscape, it's like any material culture or archaeological sites or features and things that we work with, the built environment. Um, it's just sort of a different <coughs> scale um, of, to look at, but it's out there, it has the same kinds of things like agricultural fields, pathways, roadways, to be studied in terms of the dimensions, scale, size, energetics. And um, I would argue, and some of my colleagues, that we can actually find out more, uh, I would argue, about everyday life from studying landscapes than the traditional focus on archaeological sites. And in many of the areas where I work, you're finding out a lot about where people slept for eight hours of the day and maybe had some meals, but most of their life, that they're farmers, they were out in the countryside doing things that often have archaeological signatures. So I, I'm lucky, I've worked in landscapes that I call in-your-face landscapes. They're, these are landscapes where 100% you know, of the earth was turned over into agricultural fields and the passageways, trails, paths, roads, things like this, canals. So in the Llanos de Mojos, or the Bolivian Amazon, uh, so western Amazonia, headwaters in the southeast part of the drainage, um, they're well known from the Jesuit accounts and also from geographers such as William Denham, a mentor of mine, um, who sort of reported on these things. They've been known about for quite a while, but it wasn't until um, I went down with a small project, started actually trying to investigate this archaeologically, sort of following a lot of footsteps to understand sort of who built these incredible earthworks, in this case extending to the visible horizon, uh, what, are they, what were they used for, um, why were they abandoned, um, and um, something about if they were agricultural, are they sustainable? So this raises the issue of what we call domestication of landscape. And so you know, we're all familiar with domesticated animals that we rely so heavily on, domesticated plants, our major crops, our major foods. Um, and many cultures of, of the area of, of the world develop these fairly early. Some of them go back now 10,000 years and maybe earlier um, of beginnings of controlling of plants and animals for human productive purposes. And in the Americas, many plants, few animals were domesticated. And in Amazonia, we have lots and lots of sort of semi-domesticated plants, all these juicy fruits, a lot of these we don't, we're not familiar with here in the United States, um, that are uh, manipulated by native peoples. But one thing that we found is that, in some cases, they didn't domesticate plants and animals, their genetics, control their genetics, reproduction, things like this, but they controlled their habitats through burning, through moving plants around, through opening up spaces, like the grazers that they like to hunt. So, you know, root bars, bringing grasses, so you attract more deer. Um, and so you have more protein. And so in a sense, they're creating um, incredible resources, not by domesticating plants and animals, but creating favorable habitats for the species they're most interested in um, to increase their availability. So I'm interested in areas, I'm sort of, I sort of work on the edges of the forest. Um, in much of the Amazon, 
I think they very well to realize this is not tropical forest. It was not tropical forest in the time of the past. There's lots of savannas, and many of the savannas were maintained through systematic burning. So you can see in the lower left of the satellite image is Lake Titicaca and the border between present-day Peru and Bolivia, the cloud forests, so the rainforest going down into the Amazonian drainage basin. And you see the dark green are continuous canopy. You see a lot of it missing up there in the upper right-hand corner. That's all colonization, um, very recent in um, Mato Grosso, Brazil. And then the vast savannas of Bolivia, where I work, and some of the areas that we're working, you see little strings of dark green along gallery forests and little patches of Forest Island. So this is an environment that almost anybody coming there any time of the year, either during the rainy season or dry season, would say this is a marginal environment. Floods, um, big sheet of water covers much of the landscape, some areas several meters deep. Um, and um, you know, everybody sort of moves to high ground. Uh, all the locals sort of know where the high ground is, so they have their settlements there. Many of these are archaeological sites. And even on this image, um, you see sort of the serpentine curve of the little river. But you can see some straight features in there that are not natural. And this is the first thing that, that geographers picked up when we had the availability of um, aerial photographs uh, back in the uh, 1940s, and, and they brought in lots of planes to move beef from this area to the Highland Mines in Bolivia. And so people flying would be looking out of the windows and seeing all these incredible patterns from above. This is a, a seasonally flooded savanna uh, wetland that you can have for four or five months of the year it's pretty much soggy ground. The water table is right near the surface, or sometimes above the surface, um, home puddling water. Very flat in most cases. And then you have um, these forest islands in the area I've been talking about today. Um, it's, uh, these are mostly natural features, um, upwellings of a uh, rock formation below. Uh, but in other areas, we'll talk very briefly about uh, many of these at the same scale are artificial. And then during about four months of the year, during the dry season, water can actually become scarce. The savannas dry out, the savannas are burned today by the ranchers to clear off the old grass and bring new grass back. And um, many of us think that this burning, systematic burning of the savanna was done in prehistoric times, not for cattle that they have today, but they were essentially grazing or domesticating these landscapes for many of the uh, game animals, such as the pompa deer that they um, love. They the meat package. Um, this is a fire front, kind of typical in August, that you would see is probably several kilometers long, um, burning across. And these are not wildfires. These are potentially set, very carefully checking the wind directions and things like this. They're used as management tools. And um, a lot of the clear boundaries between forest and savanna are maintained through the systematic burning. There are a number of native peoples um, that survived um, all the problems and diseases and warfare and slavery um, of the colonial period and are doing quite well today. Um, many of these speak the Arawak language, other than many other languages associated, many associate many of the remains I'll talk about with the Arawak, but I believe that other societies were involved with it. Uh, um, many of the archaeologists, like Erla Nordschild and um, Jarper William Denovan, and Many international projects have been working over the years, so I'm not the only person to do this. And um, I, my focus is sort of on the landscape features. Others have looked at the more traditional archaeological sites. And this shows a number of the features um, that are found in the area. I'll talk briefly about um, most of them. They're focused primarily on what we call green ditch sites. So um, this is truly an anthropogenic landscape. I like to use the word engineered landscape, where in many areas, 100% of it has been transformed, not only on the surface, but sometimes deep into the ground, turning soils, creating, putting water where water wasn't there before, draining areas that, that had water, and um, incredible communication systems. Um, and this is a, a very aquatic culture, at least half of the year. Um, canoes are the main form of movement. Um, and then during the dry season, you can't mobilize your canoes, you walk on grand avenues that were created. So I was mainly interested in the agricultural um, fields of these peoples. And so we know there were large populations from the early Jesuit accounts before the diseases came in and exterminated most of the people. And um, 
These were what we call raised fields. These are large uh, earthen platforms with what we call canals or ditches between them. And um, we assumed that they grew local crops on these things and were able to take advantage of this marginal landscape um, by accumulating topsoil and uh, draining uh, these platforms to enable them to plant probably quite sustainably on these systems. And literally, you can fly in a small plane. I love flying with Cessnas. Look out the window, and you can go for it. You'd be looking at your watch, and maybe 10 minutes pass, and it's just continuous field patterns. Um, then sometimes they disappear for a while, and then you'll pick them up again. Um, so we apply some general basic archaeological tools. I, I, did, I learned archaeology from traditional sites, so we dig trenches through the earthworks here. You see sort of the darker lines of the canals and the platforms of the lighter areas um, during the dry season. Um, some of the trenches through where we're trying to recover things like carbon that we can date, maybe the initial construction, uh, how long it was used, and maybe when it was abandoned by the stuff that ends up in the canals, filling up the old canals. And we can look, read the soil profiles in these and you know, estimate volumes of earth move. And once in a while we can uh, recover botanical rain, tell so something about what kinds of crops um, may have been grown in these. And so, um, race fields have been studied by many of my colleagues. I, I, I worked, as Bob said, in the highlands of Peru for many years for my dissertation work. And um, so I was attracted to this area because they had race fields. So we went down, we did you know, some of the same kinds of studies we've done in the highlands. Um, colleagues of mine were working with Maya fields, similar ones, and the Aztec ones. And, there are a number of societies in the Americas that use this as a highly productive form of using wetlands. We also do experiments, so I won't talk in detail about that today, but it allows us to get a, kind of a, uh, a window on how much labor is invested in these things, um, using certain kinds of manual labor, and um, how much maintenance is necessary in some of the experimental fields we created. So here's Bill Denovan <laughs> and my student John Walker um, on a freshly built field. This is much larger than most of them, but this is an area that floods deeply. And then six months later, with um, uh, bananas and manioc um, planted on. So you see how these things function. And a number of, we worked with a number of students, uh, wonderful uh, agronomy students, and did all kinds of great theses for their um, thesis projects, which um, tested all kinds of things that I, as an archaeologist, would never think to do, and um, could essentially show that these things are highly productive um, and potentially sustainable. We also worked with a number of small communities to try to expand the uh, experimental fields out and work with uh, communities for sort of, sort of the development project. Most of these, for very complex reasons, um, have all failed, and um, the communities have abandoned most of these fields, unfortunately. But we did get some good production data. And a colleague of mine, um, Oscar Saavedra, an economist um, in Trinidad, Bolivia, he um, has been building them with not, uh, big machines, uh, earth moving equipment, and had uh, considerable success um, working with four communities on um, sort of um, mechanized uh, raised field systems. So okay, I don't have time to talk about all, how these race fields work, but you know, just basically they're accumulating precious topsoil and sort of doubling it by building these constructions. They're um, draining locally the water off the platform, but they're, they're maintaining water alongside, which has incredible uh, importance for the functioning of these fields. Um, you can probably extend your growing season. They have all kinds of aquatic material that grows um, in these canals, including blue-green algae, a nitrogen fixer that can be used to um, renew the fertility of these fields by simply scooping out the stuff that accumulates in it. Um, and some of the more mature fields, experiments with fish come and colonize it, and tadpoles, all kinds of aquatic life within these. And um, by taking a landscape that was essentially, I'm exaggerating a bit, but homogeneous, and creating this terraforming of high, low, high, low, high, low, interface between aquatic and terrestrial, uh, has all kinds of ecological implications for biodiversity, carrying capacity, and things like this. And essentially, they were, um, in many areas, they weren't draining areas. They were actually creating artificial wetlands in many of these areas um, and use it very um, effectively for production. Let me switch here. Okay. Another feature uh, that connects all this together 
Our systems of movement. So um, this is kind of a new interest for me. Uh, there are many uh, European archaeologists who have been working on this for a long time. But if you want to talk about how people interact with their neighbors uh, and beyond, one of the best ways would be find the connections. And so these people, another example of interface landscape transformation, built incredible roadways. Um, so these are straight roads. This one's about three kilometers long, crossing from high ground to high ground, forest island to forest island. You see a number of linear features here that are not natural. And uh, many of these, since they're slight elevations or they're urban causeways, they're a little bit drain, better drained. Um, there are canals alongside them, and they're choked with vegetation here. And so trees are protected, so sometimes they show up as dark lines of brush and trees. Here's some that are becoming a little bit overgrown with the lack of regular burning of the savanna, but you see two parallel road systems. These are probably measured, one of these, it's about um, 10 to 12 feet across, about um, two to three feet high, sufficient to probably um, get above the floodwaters, the maximum floods. And two avenues, maybe one way going one direction, one way going the other, we're really not sure, and it's impossible. Then you see traces of other features, linear features there too. And you see how these things would work. High ground, high ground. So this is where people would have their orchards, a lot of some of their farms and the communities, of course, and some of the green ditches I'll talk about in a minute, and these webs of connections from one forest island to another, integrating a huge area. Um, Dan Brinkmeyer, an artist that works with me, created a number of visualizations. Most of the visualizations you see here in this talk are from him. And this shows um, one of the causeways that can be used for pedestrian traffic. They're usually wide enough so two people carrying loads can easily pass each other. I think many of them might have been shaded with palms to keep out you know, the sun crossing these long distances. And then also alongside, they're created by essentially taking soil piling it up, so it creates a canal, and you can sort of skin your canoes, big, heavy, um, wooden dugout canoes with huge um, um, cargo. We also find um, sort of more informal features that walking over these things, you just don't even notice them on the ground, but then when you look from above, from the low-flying flights and aerial photographs, you see these dark lines that go perfectly straight. They're not rays, they're actually little, slight, simple depressions on the landscape. And, um, Talking with my guides, um, uh, they, you know, they're always saying, Clark, we'll come in during the rainy season, we can haul all this stuff in our canoe and skim across the surface and not have to walk these long distances. Well, I have to, you know, I have my vacation time in the summer, so that's the only time I can go. But they explain to me, this is what you do. So these are, all you need in a dugout canoe is just a little bit of water to skim across. And, um, and so what these things are, just very simple, connections, but perfectly straight over long distances that you can um, run your canoes, um, probably not all of the year, but probably much of the year. Just to show you some of the connections that we were able to determine. So this is two forest islands. Uh, we've probably got about five kilometers uh, sort of going across the screen there, so dark areas, forest, um, settlements and things in there, and the light areas of savanna. So we mapped all the linear features there. The blue ones are major um, causeways, the, the red ones, most of those are what we call canoe paths. Uh, most of you see perfectly straight. It's as almost as if probably every family on one island had their own, you know, path to go to the other, other island. But this tells us a lot about, you know, who's, who's talking to who, who isn't talking, you know, to others, you know, but based on whether they're connected or not. So this is a little cheesy little sketch-up thing, but it sort of sh diagrammatically shows how these things might have um, been used. Um, to move people, goods, ideas, you know, back and forth across this uh, vast landscape. And then other things, uh, just very quickly go to these, because I've got some other uh, features I want to talk about, but um, what are the relationship of these um, raised causeways that are very flat landscape? And I started thinking, well, maybe they're kind of like dikes, um, like, you know, in, in the Dutch have, you know, to keep water in or out, and what if they were used as hydraulic structures, too? So, um, it kept, you know, traveling in, in this area is really difficult at the end of the rainy season. This is a quagmire of mud. And this is a so-called modern road. It was built at great expense across this landscape. And um, the engineer decided to cut costs by not putting in enough drains so the water can go from one side to the other. It's a pretty flat landscape, but water does move. So you can actually notice that even in this photo that the water over on the right is about three feet higher than the water on the left. What's going on here? This, this road is accidentally controlling massive amounts of water. So we started thinking about how can we simulate this using the geographic information systems and playing around of sort of putting 
barriers like these heterogenic causeways across the landscape, raised fields and stuff, by maybe opening and closing these things, you could raise and lower water tables over vast areas. So we're playing around with some computer models and things that, you know, sometimes the causeways form kind of blocks, not this need in this diagram, but um, <laughs> we think that they're capturing rainfall and manipulating it, storing it, I think, as long as possible. They're also, uh, as the rivers overflow, they're capturing that and holding it, and then as water tables rise and the wetlands sort of flood the uh, higher ground areas, um, they're, they're manipulating that at the same time. So an example would be taking the high ground of the river levees, two adjacent rivers. Most of the rivers kind of run parallel to a serpentine across the landscape, more to the south. And so by building a low, maybe two, three foot tall barrier between high ground and high ground, a slight slope of the landscape, you can back up massive quantities of water behind these features with very little effort. And so um, here we have the early rain season where they're probably trying to catch the first rains so they can get their crops in, whatever they're doing out there, fishing and things like this. And then the height of the season is kind of uncontrollable. And then late season, they're trying to hold it on the landscape longer. A lot of this is just simply because they'd rather ride in canoes than walk. And so where do they live? And so I'm not a site-based archaeologist, but you know we find these sites all the time. They live in these huge tail-like formations. Uh, some of these, one we mapped was 18 meters tall. Um, monumental features themselves. Um, these are built up of generations and millennia of occupations. Well, they're so essentially uh, artificial mountains on a relatively flat landscape. Um, then we have uh, forest islands, uh, small circular ones, usually with a low area around them, and indicate that somebody took soil out adjacent, piled it up on these things. And you walk into them, you sort of go up a slight rise. <coughs> Today, the cattle use it for shade and get out of the, um, the floods in the rainy season. Some people put houses on these. And these are probably where the farmers live, um, scattered on these landscapes. And every one of them we've tested, I don't, you know, don't spend much time on this, but we put a soil to pour through or a small trench, and we always come up with lots of remains indicating that this you know, was a settlement. Now, if you look across the landscape, pretty much in any direction, you're going to see hundreds of these things. And in some rough surveys that a colleague of mine did, he thinks there are 14,000 of these. Uh, I'm not sure how. How accurate that is, but if each one was a hamlet or a village, you got a lot of people out there. So in 2007, six and seven, we went to study the causeways. I had some grand idea that we would measure them, and they might be landscape calendars because they're so perfectly straight. If we could just, you know, prove that, that'd be a wonderful insight. We got out there. We were after walking through knee deep water for a couple of weeks, we decided that we banned that project and decided we would work on high ground up here on the, the dry areas, the forest island behind, on a feature that I had known about, we've been registered these things, but we hadn't spent any time on. So these are called, I call them ring ditches, the Brazilians call them geoglyphs, a wonderful word. Um, uh, the British have all kinds of terms for them, causeway enclosures and things, but essentially they're earth, circular earthworks or earthworks that close an area, a large area. So you can see the row of trees there, that's um, one that we've been studying, and you, for scale you can see a little modern community there, um, with some thatched huts around it, um, to sort of how big these things are. They're wonderful, all kinds of different shapes and sizes. We, in Bolivia we don't have the really elegant geometric forms um, that the Brazilians have, um, but we have larger ones. So, um, and, and it's probably an equal number. So this is a kind of called a D-shaped one, um, just kind of an octagon-shaped one with another partial one that they probably abandoned up here at the top and never finished. Um, some of these are quite deep. Uh, most of the ones that we first mapped were in pasture. So there have been maybe a decade of uh, cattle walking over these things, and when it's mushy and wet during the rainy season, they've caused a lot of damage to it. They've eroded the sides on it, and some of them, you can barely make them out. Um, this is one in a uh, fairly large area studied on Google Earth. The, the D-shaped one I showed you before, you see traces of some in the foreground there, sort of mapping four of them. We now know that this whole thing was enclosed with probably over a square kilometer of an outer ring that hasn't been adequately mapped yet. So it's a huge complex. And going through the forest, you, you literally fall into these things in the deep forest. It's kind of dark in there, and we'll find that these are much better preserved than the ones that are out in cow pastures today. And just, that was what I first had the wake up call. We're dealing with something here that's truly monumental. 
So we do really basic things, um, trying to map these things, and one of the ideas is to get a profile across these, and then we walk the whole thing, mapping it with a GPS, so we can get volume of Earth move. It's a fairly easy thing, it doesn't take that long. We can map usually one a day, sometimes two a day. Um, we've got something like almost 60 uh, known now. And then we do these profiles across, get a line level, measure down from it, get the profile of it. This is my, my two Bolivian colleagues working on it. It's an incredibly deep one as we go back deeper into the forest and step away from the, the present settlements and things you find these are much better preserved. Um, see how deep this, this one is. And then the number of these things. So many of them are small, 100 meters diameter, 200 meters diameter, um, but it's one after another after another after another. It's almost a grammar of where we're going to find these. We sort of predict it. Is that um, if it's a long linear island, there'll be one on each end of it. If it's a kind like of a circular island, there's usually one maybe three or so on it, kind of evenly distributed. And um, um, so a fairly regular pattern, and they had some need to construct uh, many of these. Um, some of them are quite elegant. Um, this is a, a double ring one that um, we, we've been studying, and uh, we have one now that has three rings. And so it looks like maybe they started off small, and then said, we need something bigger for whatever the purpose is. is they go out and make a bigger one, and then later, in a couple of cases, they went out and made a third ring. And the, uh, we're finding, too, that most of them are covered, the best preserved ones are covered with forest today, but um, churning up the deep soil of that red stuff and bringing it up to the surface, it probably would have been visible from long distances across this flat landscape. And you'll see some other features we're predicting on it, too, that would have made these things highly visible <coughs> on a flat landscape. So, um, I haven't excavated any of these. A German project has recently excavated one of these, has some radiocarbon dates. Um, Brazilians have excavated a couple of them. We had the opportunity when our community was building on the first one I should, the slide I showed you, they built a soccer field, and they luckily warned us the day before, so we came out of my team. We kind of followed behind the road graders, they leveled us out, and we're able to map a number of features that we think are associated um, with the use of this uh, earthwork. And unlike a lot of the occupation sites in this area, that are well known, I've walked many of them myself, even though I haven't excavated them, they're, they're huge piles of pottery. And um, you can't miss them, even if you weren't an archaeologist. But these don't have a lot of remains in them, so they don't seem to be settlements at all. And we do find pottery, um, and most of the cases, it's the classic Amazonian beer drinking room. These are uh, big, sort of bowl-like things that are used throughout the Amazon region, most of the neotropics, for drinking, uh, especially of manioc beer. And um, so we have we have 37 uh, of these mapped. We know 20 more, many from uh, Google and local informants and stuff. Um, the Germans have a project they map a number using lidar, which allows you to peer right through the forest and find these things. Um, now, there are many explanations of what these things would be like. It's a lot of like the debates about the, the similar features in the Neolithic, Bronze Age, and Iron Age of Europe. You come up with almost any explanation and probably evidence. So locals tell me, Clark, we can explain this to you. We know why they built these. They, they were, you don't understand, but there were a long time ago, there were lots of jaguars here. And the jaguars would come into our community, steal our kids at night, and you know, kill people, and we had to protect our communities from the jaguars. And so they, they built these earthworks to keep the jaguars out. I'm thinking, you know, but I heard this over and over and over from different, usually always old people. And uh, so I, you know, I'm not going to ignore this. And I've never seen a jaguar in the wild in Bolivia. I've seen the zoos like everybody has. But I've heard them at night in some of these remote areas. And we see their tracks in the morning, fresh prints. And one of them, I, best thing was I had my footprint um, in some mud, and the next day there was a big, huge jaguar paw print right in the middle of my old footprint. And, uh, you know, the guys are going, that's a big one, it's heavy, you know, you know it's like that. And so, so, yeah, they're out there. And and so, I asked Peter Stahl, who's an archaeozoologist at works with me, and I said, and he said, Clark, what can I do to help prepare for this? So I said, if I know a jaguar is falling, like, how, can they, how far can they jump? You know, how, how high can they jump? Whatever. So, he found a PDF online on how to design modern um, non-fence zoo enclosures for jaguars. And, and I started looking at the figures, and it's like, oh my god, this is like a you know, typical ring niche. You know, the depth, and if they had steep sides on them, you, know, you could actually keep a jaguar probably out of your community. How would we ever prove that? 
Trying to find some dead, dead jaguars in the ditch, you know, it's, it's going to be impossible, right? But um, one other really intriguing hypothesis is that I love chocolate. In this area, they, the community, local community Bowers calls themselves the capital of chocolate. And they, you know, it's incredible chocolate. Single source stuff, there's some European companies that discovered it. And um, I, you know, got to identify, you know, a couple plants in my life, and one is chocolate. So we're going through these bars, and we found that if you see more than three trees kind of in the same spot, you're going to find the rain ditch. Why is that? And, and this is one almost pure chocolate in an old rain ditch. And so, um, you know, what, what's the association? So the Jesuits, according to history, brought in chocolate as a cash crop from Mesoamerica. But the original lot species that were on that, that, that it was domesticated from comes from the Amazon. But the story is that Amazonian peoples just ate the kind of fleshy, fruity part of it, um, which is quite delicious. But they didn't know how to ferment and toast and grind the chocolate to actually get the chocolate out. So the idea is, well, maybe these were empty spaces abandoned, the Jesuits came in and, you know, Introduce a cash crop. But there's evidence here and there, some like pornography and stuff that indicates it might be worth investigating this as maybe these are enclosures for, say, a sacred crop, as the Maya treated it, and maybe they actually knew how to process chocolate. Um, so, you know, you could come by, you get any archaeologist say, oh, well, they could have been for defense, they could be settlements, and, and there's a little bit of data probably for all of these different things. Um, so just one thing we'll explore just for a few minutes to look at the energetics is um, we know the Jesuits described that um, these peoples were in constant warfare, um, some of it against their neighbors, but most of it against outside ethnic groups, especially the Tupi and Tupi Nama groups coming in from Brazil. And so they were raiding these settled farmers and they had to protect themselves. And we have all kinds of eyewitness accounts from shipwrecked sailors who were captured and escaped captivity, you know, the monks at Bonsan was being battened up to be eaten by the Tupinamba. And we have mercenaries, um, um, Schmidl, who's a very famous one, who wrote detailed descriptions of these wars. Everybody tended, in the 1980s, blame these on European colonialism, that these, this is part of the world system, and these people wanted metal machetes, blades, axes, things like this, and they would sell their neighbors and slave their neighbors and things to get access to this. We now know that probably warfare also was indigenous, and there was quite a lot of it in late prehistory. A recent estimate argues that 40 to 60 percent of the people living in the Amazon in late prehistory were slaves of some other group. Um, so it shows you know, the amount of probably warfare and capture and, um, and slavery at this time. Um, we also have from Von Stadi, gives us these kind of crude cartoon like images showing palisaded villages. Uh, with pretty high walls around them, and his verbal descript or detailed textual descriptions too. Schmidl was a mer German mercenary who worked with the Spanish and their entradas with native peoples, sort of using armies of native peoples against native peoples, and they would fight a battle a day. A thousand people get killed, a couple thousand get enslaved, they move to the next village, another battle, another battle. Some of this was driven by the Spaniards. But they described palisaded villages, in some cases from his drawings. He was a military expert, so he took great detail in describing war tactics and defenses. Double wall, palisade walls, with moats, sometimes without moats. And so going back to some of these deep areas of the forest, you can see that the walls, in some cases, are almost vertical, even today, after 500 years or more of abandonment. And so these would have been effective barriers against attackers, if you wanted them. Um, and you know, with the Jesuit descriptions, they actually saw some of these probably rotted out <laughs> of the walls of these things. And so then we started thinking, well, what, how much volume of earth has moved and stuff? And I can't go into detail, but actually the guy there with the machete is showing that there's a rock layer in some of the bases of these that cut through. Now it's not granite, it's not, you know, really dense rock, you can chip away at it, but incredible labor went into the construction of these things. And some of them enclose areas, we have now one area that's two square kilometers of enclosure. Um, some ditches, parts that are really deep, some not so. But if these things are palisades, I'm using a Mississippian village here, I think this is Etowa, um, this kind of example, and you can think of how many tree trunks would have been to span these areas, to encircle it, and all the labor to construct it. 
Plus, we know from uh, eyewitness accounts of the Spaniards and others that they had fire zones around these things. And so you didn't want your, you know, your enemies sneaking up and find trees right up to your wall and then you know, surprising you. So you cut down everything around. It probably supplied the trunks you needed for the palisades. Um, so we would kind of assume that at least there's a, you know, wherever, however far a, a bow can go, that was probably an area that wanted people to have open. And then how do they open these areas up? So there's a lot of debate about this. But Bill Benavin and Robert Carnier and others have done, um, they actually found groups that are still using stone axes and um, we did a number of studies um, done at the Penn Museum um, to Matthew and others that um, studied these and done really detailed experiments. And the efficiency is about one to 60 um, using a stone axe you know, versus a modern one. It takes a long time. You can do it, it takes a long time. So I have now a number of colleagues that are arguing against me and saying, well, that they weren't cutting down forests because climate at that time, there was less forest because of climate change and things, so maybe these were more open areas. But they had to, if, if we assume they had palisades, they had to get the wood from somewhere. So if it wasn't local, they maybe had to go a fairly long distance. I think a lot of these were secondary forests and occupied lands, so there probably there weren't any primary forests anywhere near them. Um, and a lot of these you know, are not huge blades, they're little tiny ones. Some of these probably would have been used and they're just kind of thrown away. But just to cut down and clear an area of 100, over 100 hectares, um, I mean 42,000 person days of labor. A person day, a day I'm calling five hours. Um, to dig the ditches, um, so for the same um, sort of area, the same circumference, uh, 15,000 days, uh, person days of labor. Um, if they had to move, I, th I think a lot of the stuff came locally from the clearing and stuff, but they could have maybe moved these logs long distances, <coughs> which adds another factor. I haven't built this into the models yet. And um, they, they probably used, if they had to bring them long distance, they used the rainy season and essentially you know, floated them across the uh, landscape to get them where they needed them. And then um, how many posts would you need? So the Spanish tell us how high these things were. They did fairly detailed measurements. To stabilize it, to go down the ground surface. So you come up with some really fairly accurate estimates. You probably get two tree trunks out of the primary forest tree um, um, for these things. But 44,000 posts, you know, to, to just go around a small one of these features. So clearing forest, adding up excavation of the ditch, you come out with some pretty astronomical features. Multiply that by hundreds. And the thing is, okay, these could have been built over long periods of time, right? But if they're ports and they're protecting you, you don't want it half built for many, many years. You want to have it, um, so these are probably thrown up fairly quickly if that's what they do. And then a number of these things. There are some forest islands that, so the white here shows the, um, these earthworks. Uh, they're within stone's throw of each other. Why do they need so many of these things? So maybe they weren't all in use at the same time, they came in and out, we're, we're really not sure. So connection, so what does all this mean? What kind of society was this? Uh, were these just in little independent communities, building and protecting themselves in this case, or building the ceremonial <coughs> dance grounds, or cemeteries? Um, you know, probably all of the above. But we can actually look at those connections. So using some um, pretty simple network analysis done by one of my um, master's students, Patrick Brett, um, downloaded programs off the web and it's played around with all these connections that we can document archaeologically, the causeways, canals between the forest islands, over 700 square kilometers of area that we have data for. And then you can run statistics on it. And it's kind of hard to believe some of the stuff that you run it for different kinds of things like moving of heavy goods between communities, <coughs> circulation of people, um, flow, control, things like this. But you come up with some interesting patterns that tell you something about maybe how this landscape was organized and also where connections are and where they aren't, which might mean boundaries of polities or you know, groups um, that are independent, say, from other systems that would pick up um, on their outsides. And then this Spanish tells us a lot about these people. There were a lot of them living on the landscape. They had what we call now chiefdoms. I think the original application of the term chiefdom was first applied for these cultures in 1959. And um, uh, these were uh, considered by the Jesuits who had had experience from many people throughout the Americas as being civilized people. They wore clothes, they had jewelry, they organized themselves, well, they had armies. And so 
Um, we probably we're, we're have the eyewitness accounts of sort of the tail end of what was something uh, grand in the late prehistoric period, maybe extending back further. So if we combine the, this data with what the Brazilians are finding across the river, across the boundary, and, and especially Acre, but in some of the other states, um, there are certain par um, similarities in language groups and also this feature of these earthworks that extend um, for about 1,000, maybe 2,000 miles across this area. Um, I think you know, it's really safe to talk about this area of the left as being kind of a culture area or an intense interaction. Uh, what does this mean? It certainly probably they weren't all under one king or one you know, capital, but they're intense interaction with each other. Michael Heckenberger likes to think big. He's, you know, there's sort of these big circles around what he calls interactive zones, interaction zones, based on the literature we have and some of his own work in uh, number two there. But, um, you know, he, he, one of his arguments by doing this is to say that these are on scale with all, you know, with even bigger than a lot of early civilizations and elsewhere in the world. Now, are these civilizations? Could we call them states? Probably not. Um, the, you know, classic civilizations? Probably not. But something big was going on, and be able to mobilize that kind of labor to create landscapes. So, one thing we're trying to do now is to try to calculate exactly how many raised fields are there. And what is the labor to build these raised fields? They were built certainly over long periods of time. But, you know, by small communities working incrementally, this stuff starts to add up um, to, you know, what communities can probably do. That's an incredible construction. So, you can see here a very eroded um, earthwork. And just to end, so what kind of environmental impact does this have? Deforestation, massive areas, uh, many of these forest islands probably didn't have a tree on them, so maybe some shade trees and possibly some orchards that were managed, chocolate groves, things like this. But um, today, the biological studies in the Bolivian Amazon show that these very areas have the highest biodiversity in Bolivia. Not quite as high as some of the areas in Brazil and elsewhere but um, very high biodiversity in spite of what these peoples were doing. And I think this is all part of a grander sort of scheme of domestication of landscape that um, you know, a lot of the plants that grow there today are economic species, useful to the local peoples like the chocolate, these groves they consider wild, um, and many, many other resources, many of some of them not used today, they're created by this massive transformation of the landscape. And like, I'm sure you're, you're the same way. When I hear a chainsaw in my neighborhood, it's like, oh, who's cutting down that tree? And I run out, we live in an old neighborhood, kind of like the ones around here, and I run out and see, oh, is that tree really, does it have to come down? And, you know, it's, it's painful to see that. Um, and, you know, we kind of grow up loving trees. You know, that's what people say it's in our nature or something, you know. Um, but I've learned, you know, working in savannas for a long time with savannah peoples, is that they have a very different aesthetic. And their aesthetic is the perfect landscape is wide open with not a single tree on it. That shows good management of burning systematically. And, you know, that's a clean landscape. And, um, and you know, a very different aesthetic about what something should be. You know? But a lot of this has incredible implications in biodiversity and what is sort of allowed to grow there and, and what isn't. So I think you know, these, these societies can tell us a lot about how environments came to be. And certainly, in these cases, I would argue, throughout the Americas, these are human-created and have long, complex human histories. And so if we're going to do anything about these to manage them today, I think we can learn a lot from what past peoples did, maybe positively, maybe negative, on these landscapes. It's through archaeology we can tell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clark. Uh, would you like to ask him a few questions? <laughs> Um, so, so the um, the the Eckenberger slide that you that you showed with the, with the large ovals, and obviously much of the effort of um, archaeologists working in the Amazon and South America uh, is going toward the idea of some sort of uni unifying activity that can speak to some kind of larger mass mass process, and I'm wondering. As um, you know, this is kind of an internalist question in a sense. Um, obviously, there are many kinds of similarities. What are the what are the salient differences that you see between, for instance, the Mocos and 
um, the coast of um, northeastern Brazil, where Real Valle was working, that that sort of caused you to 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 um, puzzle um, in terms of trying to create these um, these different things. In term, you know, in terms of the the different relationships that exist. Um, what are, what are what are the hardest puzzle pieces to sort of fit together for the for the community of archaeologists working in the region? Well, uh, I think part of the thing of looking for how all these things connect. So archaeologists are always looking for similarities. That's, that's our meat and potatoes. And so, um, you know, it's kind of how you divide up your universe, you can make your arguments in different ways. Um, so there's a lot of that going on, too. But I think um, it's kind of a mistake to just assume that to prove that big things were happening here, that it has to all be connected in some way, you know, under a political unit or some kind of interaction sphere or whatever. These were very cosmopolitan people. Like they almost integrated with Greek. They were new people, they traveled long distances, their migration is documented. But I think that's a, sort of a wrong approach in that um, I'm willing to take what I call a bottom-up approach. And that these, you know, this is the work of communities, you know, sometimes over long periods of time, sometimes not, that are creating these works. And so they're sharing ideas and things, but it's not all connected with some kind of, you know, what we think is hierarchy and centralization. And that, that worked for many civilizations throughout the world. It's well documented as a form of creating complexity. But I think um, others have argued that complexity, interaction, and similarities can be created in a number of ways without having necessarily to have you know, fixed hierarchies and centralization. So I, I really think that, um, not, in some ways, I couldn't care less if this was a state or a chiefdom or a tribal society, because I think you know, most of the work here was done by farmers and village folk communities. Um, they did a lot of pride in what they were doing. One of the things about farmers throughout the world is that um, they're willing to invest in land to do these kinds of things if they have some kind of guarantee that their children, their kids, their grandkids, and on down the line can live on those lands. So it makes it worth putting these investments in. We call this land desk capital. It's a really powerful concept. And People have looked at this in terms of, you know, why is there poverty in many rural areas that could be productive? Well, a lot of it has the fact that they're not the landowners, so why put in the investment, right? So um, I think that a lot of, you know, it's not, I mean, never argued that these systems never change, that once they're put in place, they stay forever. But we can show incredible continuity over long periods of time with populations, some probably ups and downs now and then. I'm going to explain my multitude of factors. But um, I tend to be one of, or decentral view of decentralization um, and less of, of trying to kind of piece together all these bigger things to, to try to kind of compete with ideas of say Western or you know, in other areas where like Mesopotamia and China and others where that our our society is going way back time. Just curious when you brought time into this and I know the love of what you're doing now is more extensive rather than intensive than we don't have. But is there a sense of the time depth of these systems or are we ways in which they develop the time? So I, I think a lot of the, the ring digits here, the geographic are pretty late for this um, and, and but we don't have a lot of dates on them. There's some early dates from Brazil that go back 2,000 years, and fairly convincing argument that when I started then, but most of the dates are fairly late. There's a problem, though. You can only live in certain places on this landscape. So people probably lived there before these earthworks were built. They lived there during the earthworks, and they lived there after. So what did you find there is associated with, right? So that's a major problem. Archaeologists are always point out, well, Clark, we've never found a post hole for documenting palisades. And actually, there have been some found, um, but only a small sample from one that was excavated back in the 1980s. But um, I think that because if you saw those, those ditches, uh, once the sides start collapsing in, which all happens, and what, if you want to be use it for picture, you had those palisades pretty close to the ditch. And so that part is caved in. So archaeologically, probably the post holes that we would be looking for are not there. So it's still a little, you know, a little bit over there. But um, the raised fields go back, with good dates going back as early as 1000 BC. Uh, when people out in these uh, wetlands and savannas, uh, building earthworks for agriculture and things. And, um, but we also find in, in the 90s, we did a lot of trenches through the raised fields. We find they come in and out of use. 
We don't know exactly why. It could be that they, you know, we're looking at such a minute scale of the bigger picture that they could have just moved over 10 feet and cultivated over there, and this was abandoned for a while or whatever. So it's really hard to get the, the picture. But um, I think that you know, these were major works to create this landscape for settlement, for communication, and agriculture. They had incredible investment in this, and um, it looks like that you know, it, it worked for, for a considerable amount. You mentioned uh, an abundance of the Chichen drinking vessels associated with these rainforests. I was wondering if you found uh, similar kinds of concentrations of maybe different sorts of ceramics associated with other kinds of rainforests in this area. And so we, we collect anything that we find, and it's amazing. You, know, you go to one of these and you'll see some posture. It's like, oh, we're going to find something here, and it's in a cow path or something. And then you say, oh, there's some over here, over here. And then you find, oh, that's all from one vessel that got broken and scattered, you know, from <laughs> one vessel. So, and, and we just like find the quantity. So, and I'm, I don't focus much on the pottery, but there's a germ project and a living project that's done a lot of that work. And, um, you know, in, in the occupation sites, you find a whole range of, you know, all kinds of vessels for storage, for brewing, for cooking food, um, all different sizes of vessels, which is common in the Amazon. So you have, food kits for, you know, entertaining a thousand guests, you know, big community events, and then you have smaller things for family events, and you know, like birthday parties and things like that. And then you have your sort of day-to-day -day kitchenware, kind of three sets that exist. And um, so they're, they're documenting that. But on these things, the pottery tends to be, you know, and you were sort of fine wares, but, you know, they're, they're very elegant, they're highly decorated in most cases, and some of the, the Brazilians now are finding very similar things within these features. So it seemed to be sort of special. <coughs> and some of them they found burial urns with human remains, uh, but it's hard to tell if they were directly associated with these or not. Some of them may have been burial grounds. Yes? What kind of interaction would these uh, communities have had with Highlanders uh, and the Highlanders? That's a good question, because up in the Highlands, if you're familiar with the Morocco Society and um, some of the other sides, they built great fields. I, I did my dissertation on the island, that's where I got interested in the stuff, so I know those things, I published on them. And everybody wants to say, oh, well, which one came first? Who influenced who? And it's always, in the mind of most archaeologists, the highlanders figured this stuff out early, and it diffused down into the lowlands. But we now know that, that probably the ones in the lowlands, in Venezuela, Colombia, uh, parts of Peru now, and uh, in Bolivia, parts there are some that might be in Paraguay too, that this use, intensive use of wetlands, some with raised fields, uh, goes way, way back to some, probably some of the earliest inhabitants of this area. But we don't have any dates beyond about 6,000 years ago. That's only one or two sites. So um, it's, um, you know, it's difficult to... Any other questions for Clark? If not, uh, please join us for a reception at Nanny Hall.